I do not intend to prove to you today the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. It's indisputable. So much so, those who would oppose the idea have the burden of proof of proving that it did not happen in the face of a mountain of evidence that says otherwise. What I want to do today, though, is we celebrate Easter Sunday. If you read my article in the newsletter, every Sunday for the Evangelical Church is Resurrection Sunday because every Sunday, the first day of the week, we gather because that's when Jesus Christ came out of the grave. And just as God had summoned his people in the Old Testament to, to gather on the last day of the week to commemorate his creation, so we are summoned as evangelical Christians to gather on the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' recreation where he, where he conquered sin and death and hell in the grave and came forth. So every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. But having said that, you can't deny that you and nearly everybody you know are painfully aware, keenly aware that today is a Sunday with a heightened emphasis on the resurrection. That's why I wrote in my article that I have friends who boo and hiss at the idea of new clothes, children dressing in new clothes, or, or Easter egg hunts, or bunnies. Or, that's fine. Boo and hiss. I don't have that much air to waste. What I'd rather do is say to you children who are excited to be wearing the clothes you're wearing today, we pray for you when you will be excited to wear the righteousness of Christ. Remember that when you put on your new outfit, you dress up. We want you to be found dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. If you've had Easter egg hunts, if you're going to an Easter egg hunt, I've watched you. And you get... You get energetic, aggressive. My prayer for you as your pastor is that you would be equally aggressive in seeking out to know Jesus Christ. He is more valuable than any boiled egg, any plastic egg, no matter what that plastic egg has in it. Jesus Christ is more valuable than that. And so, so my, my desire today is that we, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not by proving it to you, don't need to, beyond dispute. But by asking the question, you see, when I witness to somebody, when I share the gospel, I ask them basically three things, and then I, we'll, we'll go to a passage in a little while here. I ask them, who is Jesus Christ? Tell me your understanding. Who is Jesus Christ? Because that matters. We don't get to make him up. We don't get to tell you how we feel. Who is Jesus Christ? Who's he revealed himself to be? Then what did he come to earth to do? You get wrong who he is, if you get wrong what he did, it doesn't really matter what else you think you got right. And the third question I ask, though, is really the question we're taking up today. What difference, if any, in the light of who he is, in the light of what he came to do, what difference, if any, has that made in your life and in my life? So the question I ask today, from the passage we read in Romans, have you been raised from the dead? I want to propose to you a different model. Now, some of you are coming from the generation that is fascinated with the so-called zombie apocalypse. The zombie apocalypse is, of course, where these, where these beings come back from the dead, and they're, they're, they're weird-looking and awful, gory and stuff, and they're walking around, and people are, are scared to death running from them. I want to offer to you a new creation apocalypse of people who are living, having been brought back from the dead, living compelling lives, winsome lives, attractive lives that people don't run from. They run too because their lives are not attractive. Their lives are not pleasant. Their lives are not fulfilling. And as I understand what the scripture teaches on this matter, that's what Jesus does. He raises up an army, a society, of new creation. Let's look at the text and see what it says. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. We'll, we'll unpack in some manner all of these and then add a passage from 2 Corinthians as we come to the conclusion today. First, Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. Stand with me if you would 
If you found that in your Bibles, we're going to have it on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you or access to, a, to an electronic version of the Scripture. Follow along as I read from the English Standard Version. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin in order that grace may abound? He's answering a false accusation about some previous things he said. By no means. The strongest negative you can say in the Greek and say cleanly. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord open our eyes today by His Spirit to see, for those of us who are saved, to have the illumining work of the Spirit to see what the Apostle is talking about and its implications for our lives. For those who have not yet had their eyes opened in that powerful experience of salvation, my prayer is that you will see for the first time today. That lights will come on. Meanings will come together. That you will leave this place, or at least before you pillow your head tonight, Having been raised from the dead by grace through faith. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we're just gonna we're gonna take a, a, a cursory look at all we can take of these verses, uh, chapter six, verses one to fourteen. You see, first of all, in this Paul's contrast of sin and death and grace and life. Sin and death and grace and life. When he asked in verses one to two, what shall we say then? Are are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that Paul was accused, by the way, because of his pressing of free grace, free grace, free grace, not saved by law, not saved by law keeping, but free grace, the free, unmerited, unmitigated, unparalleled grace of God. People were accusing him and saying, well, Paul, you're just, you're just promoting licentiousness. You're, you're promoting the idea that people can be saved and then live like hell. He's answering it. That's what we should say. By no means. Paul says, don't you even think that. Don't you suggest that. Don't you assign that to me. Don't you put that in my mouth. No way. How can we who died to sin, I want you to watch his use here. Terms like death, life, buried, raised. Watch these, this language here. He is going after something when you come to faith in Christ, it's not just mental assent. It's not just a, uh, well, I, I raised my hand, I bowed my head, I prayed the prayer, I signed the card, I walked forward, I got dipped. You can have all of those things and never have been raised from the dead. That's what he wants you to know. That's what he wants the Romans to know. These Romans are confused about this. Paul is writing this to, to Rome. He's never been there. We have in the, in the book of Romans, and I don't, know, I don't know if God will let me live long enough, be around long enough to do it. It's been, it's been nearly 13 years or more since y'all have gone through Romans here, and, and you have no idea when I came in how I was chomping at the bits to do that. But I knew in terms of your journey through that, you, you didn't need that just then. But if God lets me get through 1 Corinthians and still leads me, I would love for us to tackle Romans and see the glory of God in the gospel here. This by no means expression, Paul uses it 14 times in his writings, nine of them in Romans. He's never been to Rome. He hadn't met with the church there yet, but they're really confused on some things, and he is desperately trying to hammer it out in a letter to straighten them out. How can we who died to sin? That's what happened when you were saved, by the way. If you've been saved by grace through faith, you died. You died. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to celebrate baptism, believer's baptism by immersion, and the Lord's Supper. I love, I love when we can bring those together. 
So let's, let's agree. Let's go out and, and see the Lord use us to bring more people to saving faith so when we gather for the Lord's Supper, we can have somebody to baptize. I think that'd be wonderful if that happened. We're going to put them together. And you're going to see in the waters of baptism. We'll bring J.R. and Ashley in. J.R. will come down from this side. He'll walk into the waters. He'll face you. We'll talk to him a little bit. Then we'll immerse him. We'll plunge him beneath the water. Death. Burial. Raise him up. Resurrection. Not in the, the water doesn't do that. It is the powerful symbol. What he's saying, what Ashley's saying when they stand in the water. What you said when you stood in the water was, I'm not who I was. That person died. By God's grace, I've been raised. I'm to a new life in Christ. And notice when we do this, he comes in this way. He turns, goes another way. He turns. That's what Paul's going after here. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Second thing he says, he asserts that all true Christians have been baptized into Christ Jesus. And he uses this, this imagery here. And I, I love my brothers and sisters from other communions of faith. Okay, I gathered with, with one here Friday night for a, Friday, uh, for a good Friday service. It was a sweet time, precious time. Brothers and sisters, you cannot take this word baptizo and give it any force of what Paul is saying unless baptizo means in the text what baptizo means as a word. Plunge. Emerge. Listen to him. Allow me to substitute. Because the word, remember, the word baptize in our, in our scriptures has not been translated. If you could read Greek, you would see the word baptizo. It's just been transliterated. It's just been brought from what it sounded like in the Greek to what it sounds like in English. So I'm, I'm going to translate. Do you not know that all of us who have been immersed into Christ Jesus, we're immersed into his death. Does that sound like you had kind of a little brush up, a little exposure to his death? Plunged. We were buried, that's what it sounds like to me. We were buried, therefore, with him by immersion into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Brothers and sisters, you have to be raised. If you've been dead and buried, you've got to be raised to walk. All right? That's the picture here. Kenneth Wiest in his word studies says this is the introduction or placing of a person or thing into a new environment or into union with something else so as to alter its condition or its relationship to its previous environment or condition. When you're saved, you change environments. Now, we still live on the earth. The difference is we're still in the world, just not of the world. When we've been baptized into Christ's death. The third thing, Paul asserts that all Christians are identified with Christ specifically in his death and resurrection. In the, in the New Testament, baptism took place in public places, so down by the Jordan River. Uh, you may remember Gatana Gatana coming here and telling us about a baptism that he knew of on the banks of a river in Eritrea, where before daylight the believers gathered together because the, the officials were looking for Christians. The pastor went into the water. He exhorted the, the candidates. The candidates went down one by one. He baptized them in the, on the shore there. As they were coming up, the officials rode up on horseback. What are you doing here? Well, they knew what they were doing. They'd been tipped off. It was a group of Christians having a, a baptism service. The authorities drew their weapons and said, renounce Jesus Christ. And they would not. And they shot the pastor and the candidates who'd been baptized in the water where they stood and mingled their blood with the waters of baptism. That's how serious it is. Thank God in this country, to this point, we don't have any fear when we enter the waters of baptism. That the authorities will come in and shoot us where we stand in those waters. But it's happening for believers all over the world today. Because you see, the authorities understand what it means. 
These people are moving from the environment of sinful, hedonistic, cultural norms into the environment of life in Christ. So Paul says in verses 5 and 6, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, his death was a brutal, bloody, gory death on a cross. Our death is a death to self. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection. Like, see, have I been raised from the dead? A resurrection like his. Has it ever occurred to you why on that morning there were reports of people who had died coming out of their tombs? You ever thought about that? It's a pretty powerful object lesson, isn't it? What's the meaning of this going to be? This, this death on the cross, this darkness consuming the world, this earthquake shaking, these rumors of him coming out of the tomb. What's the meaning? It means that, it means that his coming out of the tomb means that others will be coming out of the tomb. Certainly anticipating the final resurrection, but that's not what all he's talking about here. He's talking about what happens in our lives when we are saved by grace through faith. And signing a pledge, walking an aisle, raising a hand, praying a prayer, getting wet from head to toe, cannot touch this reality. In fact, without this reality, those other things are just instruments of deception. We know, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him. I want to go through Romans so badly. See, there are people who have this dual nature, not nonsense. Well, that's the old man, that's the new man. Folks, the scripture teaches if you've been saved, the old man died. And when you battle with sin, that's not the old man getting the best of you. That is the new man battling the condition of sin. Read Romans 7 with those lenses. The old self was crucified. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, might be rendered powerless so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You're set free. You say, well, I cannot help it. Well, you've told me all I need to know. Whether or not you've been dead. We're not talking sinless perfection. You know better than that. What we are talking is that the battle is on. When we've been brought from the, from the grave to new life, the battle is on. In the fourth way, Paul stresses that the old sinful self has been killed. For one who has died, verses 7 and 8, has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Notice this. Watch this. This death, life. Death, resurrection. Did we die? Did you die? Kenny Rogers was for years one of my favorite uh, singers. He had a song, pretty song. You decorated my life. It's a nice song, but not a theological song that you want to apply to the matter of Christianity. We don't need redecoration. We need resurrection. We don't need window dressing. Fix this up, straighten this up, clean this up. My friend R.F. Gates used to talk about how the church has missed its mark many times and it, and it goes in the, into, the, into the cosmetic business rather than the, than the uh, conversion business. He said, Bill, we take these corpses, we get them all dressed up, put a little rouge on their faces, sit them on the pew, and they go, Zzz. we run them, kind of prop them up, prop them back up, try to make them look alive, and then, Zzz. not what Paul's talking about here. He's using death, resurrection. Not, not just to celebrate the reality of what Jesus Christ accomplished, but the implication that he accomplished that so that all who would be found followers of Christ would have that in their own lives. Verse 8, now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Again, certainly. At the last trumpet, when the dead in Christ rise and we're taken to be home together with the Lord. Yes, but not just then. Now. Live with Him. Real quickly. 
Look at these passages. Romans 6, 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God, what? As those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Romans 6, 22. But now that you have been, that's a perfect, you have been, that means it has a lasting consequence. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit of you, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Romans 7, 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law, to the law holding you guilty before God. You not only die to sin, you die to the law's ability to, to punish you. Died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to one another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit to God. What kind of fruit do you think that is? Resurrection fruit. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to keep on presenting your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, here's the deal. People can attend worship, and I have no doubt that all over the place today, there are people attending worship that have, you haven't seen the doors of a church for years or months or whatever. You can attend worship, but spiritual worship can only take place in those who have been raised from the dead. In Romans 5, 21. So that as sin reigned in death. See, sin has dominion over those who've never been raised from the dead spiritually. Grace also might reign. And the might there is not, it be possible, no, that's not how might is used in, in these tenses here. Would would be another. Reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, Paul says in verse 8, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Again, ultimately, yes, but presently also. Five. Paul proclaims the death of death and the death of Christ. And we could spend a lot of time here, but we don't have a lot of time today, so I want to I want to press the summary. These three verses are essentially a summary of what Paul has just been teaching about the believer's death to sin and his resurrection life in Christ. He also stresses the permanence, not occasional, not temporary, the permanence. See, if we imagine that we died and that we rose and that we died again, we just got the rose part wrong. We died, we stirred, we died. The rose rising is permanent. So in chapter Six verses nine to eleven. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Looked like it did. Good Friday, crucifixion, disappointment by those who had followed and hoped he was the Messiah. Death got him. They thought it's going to get us too. No, it didn't. I love. That song, Resurrecting. He was buried in a tomb that was borrowed for three days. S.M. Lockridge said he didn't need one of his own. He wasn't going to use it very long. Three days would do. Why? Like that song again, our God has robbed the grave. You see, in salvation, God is the ultimate grave robber. And he showed that infallibly in bringing Jesus back to life. Verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin. Now his death to sin means that he drew out the powers. And I've used to you before when we've looked at this on, on this occasion in past years. You need to picture the cross as a place where Satan comes with everything he's got and he throws the, this, this powerfully fanged serpent who latches himself onto Jesus to take life out of him. But when this serpent latches onto Jesus, he finds out something very surprising. Jesus is the one drawing life from him. We sing a hymn, he breaks the power of canceled sin. and Makes the captive free. 
His blood can make the vilest clean. His blood avails for me. He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. You see the challenge there? So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So he, his conclusion, let not therefore, let not sin therefore reign in salvation. We've talked about this before. Justification is our, our we have been delivered from the penalty of sin. So reigning sin is not our issue anymore. Remaining sin is, we battle remaining sin. To Paul, who's writing this in Romans 6, go read Romans 7 this afternoon. Take some time and read it. Battles with remaining sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. See? Who we obey? Do we delightfully obey God? Do we strugglingly yield sometimes to obey sin? Can't be comfortable there anymore. John says that in 1 John. Cannot go on sinning if you've been born of God. Verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. See, reckon, consider, conclude, present. Who you offer? Paul said in Romans 12. Keep on offering yourself as living sacrifices to God. Stop offering yourself to sin. Be presenting yourselves to God as those who have been brought, get it again, from death to life. Do you get a, get a sense here that Paul wants us to be thinking about dying and rising, death, resurrection? And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. You see... Christians are not remodeled sinners. Christians are resurrected saints. And anything less than a resurrected saint does not biblically qualify for the title, the term, Christian. He says in verse 14, for sin. Will not, doesn't say should not, be nice if it doesn't, sin will not have dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. See, here's, what's he even arguing here? Because you're under grace, it doesn't mean you can sin all you want. Luther did trip people up at one point. Martin Luther said, love God and sin all you want to. People went, oh my soul, Dr. Luther. He said, because if you truly love God and you sin one time, that's more than you want to. You've been saved. When I talk to people about their standing, before God. I take them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to turn with me. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 20. I want you to think as we close about the spiritual death, burial, and resurrection of those who've been saved. And I want you to be as honest before God as if you were standing before the Bema and He were pressing this to you. Because one day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll be standing there. You'll be standing there. Dishonesty only promotes deception. We can deceive ourselves here. You won't be able to deceive God. Think with me about this. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us. What controls you? The love of what? Fill that in. The love of blank controls me. Paul says... If you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, disciple, the love of Christ controls us because, he says, here's why. We've concluded, you, you've seen this term before, conclude, reckon, concluded this, that one has died for all. Talking about Jesus' death. Now watch this. Therefore, the death of Jesus wasn't just a good idea where people say, oh, look how he loved. Oh, that's so sweet. His death did something to people. Therefore, all have died. Did Jesus' death kill you? Come here. Did you come one day? you reckoned yourself dead 
Jesus' death caused you to die. Think with me about death, resurrection now. Look at verse 15 where he shifts his metaphor. And he died for all. In order that, here's the purpose, that those who live, notice what he said here. This death of Jesus that causes, and the all there's obviously a specific group of people. It's not, I had a friend of mine, <laughs> we were, he, was, he, was, he was a sweet guy in a lot of ways. Fundamentalist, capital F, fundamentalist. He, was going, he said, no, Bill, all means all. And that's all, all means. I said, really? So when it says that all Judea went out to see him, do you think there was not a person left in the region of Judea? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Does an Adam all die? So in Christ all will be made alive? Are you a universalist? Do you believe Jesus is going to say? Oh, no. I, okay. Then, then all means what it means in context. Look at the context here. He died for all, whoever these all are, therefore all have died. And he died for these all in order that those who live. See, it's, it, the impact of Jesus' death is not just death. The impact of Jesus' death is death and resurrection. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Do you get the sense here that Paul's again talking about death and resurrection? I got to ask you. Not only did Jesus' death kill you, did Jesus' resurrection bring you back to life. In fact, I ask this question to people all the time. There are some of you I've talked to about this before, so you will be familiar with this. I like to take a sheet of paper, a blank sheet of paper, put zero, which is birth, draw a timeline out here. For me, it takes a couple of sheets of paper to get the whole thing in. Zero to whatever. Then I ask people, put on, put on that your religious experiences. Maybe you were christened when you were eight, eight days old, I don't know. Maybe you were confirmed when you were 12. Maybe, and just start putting in all the religious experiences. Well, we had, we had VBS and I walked there, I'll put that in. We had Harvest Sunday, okay, put that in. Draw them timeline. Came back from camp, huh? What's your timeline? Look on that timeline and tell me when, if ever, when, if ever, be honest. Has a time in your life where you would say, boy, not necessarily a day and a date. Right here is when I ceased living primarily for myself and began to live for him, verse 15, who died and was raised. Right about here is when I, when I died to who I was. And I experienced a resurrection from the dead. I, I was raised to walk in what Romans calls a newness of life and to follow him. You see, be honest, if you can't find that spot on your timeline, admit it. Because here's the deal. There are people all over this country today who showed up for church service. Easter. I go every Easter because I have a conviction about that. And they could not face a time. And wouldn't it be the, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the best thing in their lives be if they discovered there's, I don't have a place in my timeline to put an X where that's happened to me. There are multitudes of people who never give that a second thought, who will skip through life happy they made it to a few Easter services who will die and perish and go to hell because they never died while they lived. They never died of their sins. They were never brought from death to life by the gospel. 
You see, Paul says in verse 16, from now on, when that happens, we regard no one according to the flesh. That's, that's all he did before. Who was Jesus to Saul of Tarsus? He was a blasphemer. He was a heretic. He and anyone who acknowledged him deserved to be stoned to death according to Saul of Tarsus. Something happened on the road to Damascus, though. He encountered the living Christ. He says, we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Why? Because Saul died on the Damascus road. Not physically. He died. Saul was brought to life on the Damascus road. He was helped to see that all of his Judaism was leading him to hell. Because he had missed God's Messiah who had come to save sinners. Do you regard people in a fleshly way or do you regard them spiritually? Therefore, he says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. That's resurrection talk. The old has passed away. That's death and burial. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, through whom Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This passage talks about a ministry of reconciliation, a message of reconciliation. It summons us to be ambassadors to declare that message. So here's the message, folks. On Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, I plead with you. If there is not on your timeline a place where you can say, at this point in my life, I died to me. Me, my, mine, I took a back seat to him, his. It's not there. What a great place to be. Because you could live the rest of your life not thinking about it. See, I don't, I don't believe the Lord shows anybody that reality when he doesn't intend to show them that Jesus died for them and rose for them and bring them savingly to faith in him. That's the glorious good news of the gospel. God doesn't play with you. doesn't tease you. He encounters you. Have you... Can you honestly say, if you, as if we were taken suddenly before God, and he says, have you been raised from the dead? You've been raised from the dead? My son was. Have you? You see, resurrection, nothing less than resurrection, will grant you access to heaven. And I'm not talking about after they bury you out here somewhere at the last trumpet. I'm talking about now. Have you died to yourself? Not absolutely, we struggle with remaining sin. But essentially, essentially, primarily, because we live to Him. We live for Him. You see, please understand, I want to say this with all pity and compassion I can. If that's not your case, this Sunday doesn't mean anything to you. The resurrection of Jesus doesn't mean anything to you. You stand before God and say, but, I, but look, I, I, heard some, I read some stuff about the resurrection. I heard some pretty good teaching on it. And I, I, if it hasn't happened to you, my prayer to God is that your timeline would experience a radical change where a blood red X could be marked on your life and say it was here. It was here. I came face to face that when Jesus died, he died that, that me might be killed. And he died that by his grace and for his glory, I might be raised to new life and live for him no longer. No longer. It's got to be my way. No, oh, it's got to be his way. When the clash comes, I realize I'm pushing for my way and it's pushing against his way. I say, I, I yield. I yield. I yield. Are you living in the light 
of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the empty tomb, a yielded life which reflects that you have been raised from the dead. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, what a blessed day. What wonderful singing. <laughs> Up from the grave he arose. Christ the Lord has risen today. He crowned the Lamb upon the throne. We see the man of sorrow. Wounded for our transgressions. And yet we look closer and we see this empty tomb. Hallelujah, God. Be praised. Jesus has risen from the grave, O oh God. May the resurrecting King be resurrecting me. And I pray for any here today who have not yet experienced that resurrection by grace through faith. And I pray that even today, in the shadow of this glorious celebration of the resurrection, that they would be brought from death to life. You could look back and say, yeah, that's, that's where I put my eggs. <laughs> that's where I put my eggs. God brought me from death to life. So we can live no longer primarily for ourselves, but for him who loved us and gave himself for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.